content warning. The following episode includes discussion of violent themes, specifically war and genocide. Listener discretion is advised. Earlier in the U.S. Middle East Relations series, I recalled where I was when the terror attacks on September 11, 2001 occurred. The airplane hijackings that led to the planes being crashed into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, killing nearly 3,000 people. The deadliest terror attack on American soil. I was in college getting ready for a full day of resident advisor training with my colleagues, and we watched the attacks unfold live on television in the lobby of our dorm. But what I didn't say is that while it was surreal to watch and absolutely horrifying, a part of me wasn't particularly surprised. The growth of radical Islamic terrorism was a long time coming, as was the tension between the West and a number of Muslim countries and groups in the Middle East and South Asia. In the weeks, months, and years to come after 9-11, the narrative embraced and amplified by most U.S. politicians and the mainstream media was that these Islamic terrorists hated the West due to our way of life, that we were wealthy, had freedoms, our women weren't covered up, and we pray to a different God. And when I say most U.S. politicians bought into it, this isn't even a partisan statement. After all, the decisions to go into Afghanistan and later Iraq, even though Iraq wasn't involved in 9-11, were made with the approval of the vast majority of Congress, both chambers, Democrats, and Republicans alike. And yes, the mainstream media, not just Fox News, we're buying into it as well. Former political and sports commentator and known liberal Keith Olbermann, who at the time was on MSNBC, came for Germany, bringing up the country's Nazi past when their leadership criticized the U.S. for their pursuit of war during the first term of President George W. Bush. But was it true that this was why radical Islamic terror groups hated the United States and the West more generally? You could definitely find leaders of these extremist groups that would comment on the West's perceived decadence and lack of modesty and morals. But for many of these groups, this narrative, this understanding of why the hate for the West is very surface level and doesn't really provide us a clear picture of how we got here. The fact was that over the past century, the history of relations between the West and the Middle East were fraught with war, bloodshed, and conflict, with Western influence contributing to war, not only between the Middle East and the West, but among countries, religious sects, and tribal groups in and around the Middle East. Let me be clear. This is not in any way condoning terrorism of any kind. But having a safer, healthier, more peaceful future means we need to tell the truth about the past. I am your host, Jay Poole, and this is Potstirer Podcast. Welcome to Potstirer Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. In the last installment of the U.S. Middle East Relations series, I focused on early immigrants to the United States from the Middle East and the Mediterranean, including the role of religion and race, and how they work together in the acceptance of early immigrants from places like Syria and what would later become Lebanon. I also walked through the history of how people of Middle East and North African descent were placed in the racial hierarchy and eventually became classified on the U.S. Census as white. Now for the next few installments of U.S. Middle East relations, we're shifting gears and discussing what was happening in the early and mid-20th century in the Middle East and surrounding areas with high Muslim populations. I will outline a few of the major developments that led to conflicts and helped 
give rise to violent extremism in this region that would later lead to September 11, the forever war in Afghanistan, and other conflicts with state and non-state actors in the region. In this episode, I'm going to talk about borders. The relationship between the United States and the Middle East is complicated and has been for pretty much as long as the United States has been a country. In part two of the series, I discuss some of the early events that began to shape that relationship. Some of the reason for that complication over the past century has to do with the borders between Middle Eastern countries. While the Middle East is rich in history and culture, the modern borders are a more recent development in the grand scheme of things. Let's rewind a little bit and discuss the Ottoman Empire. In part one, I discuss some of the empires that significantly influenced Middle Eastern history, including the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire, called the Byzantine Empire by modern historians, which was officially Eastern Orthodox Christian, had at one time controlled much of the Mediterranean and the Middle East, reaching its zenith, around 500 CE, but declined slowly over time until they were eventually conquered by the Ottoman Turks. The Ottoman Turks were descended from the Seljuk Turks, a Turkish people who originally came from the steppes of Central Asia. The Ottoman Turks took the capital of the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, also known as Byzantium, which is in modern-day Turkey, and made it their own renaming it Istanbul. And with that, they became the Ottoman Empire. At its height in the 1500s, from its base in Asia Minor, also known as Anatolia, the Ottoman Empire encompassed much of the Middle East, North Africa, and Southeastern Europe. The empire stretched from the Danube to the Nile. It was a Muslim empire, which at least at its height was tolerant of minority religions and ethnicities and it boasted of achievements in a great number of fields, including architecture and astronomy. It was a cultural, military, and commercial powerhouse. But like all empires, the Ottoman Empire wouldn't last forever. In the case of the Ottomans, there were a number of reasons for their decline, and if you look at past and present empires, many of those reasons look a bit familiar. The empire had become complacent and failed to sufficiently modernize, while their neighbors, especially in Europe, gained ground on them. Europe experienced the Enlightenment from the mid-1600s through much of the 1700s that transformed philosophy, reason, and eventually governance. Europe was also undergoing the Industrial Revolution through the 1700s and 1800s, which transformed their economies from agrarian, based on farming and livestock, to modern economies, based on industry and manufacturing. These changes, particularly that of the Industrial Revolution, meant that many European countries would be able to mass-produce advanced, deadlier weapons. The Ottoman Empire was still largely dependent on agriculture to make everything run, so industrialization just across their borders, was already becoming a problem. And at least at the start of their decline, they didn't see their being left behind as an issue. After all, they had been dominant for centuries. So if it worked for them back then, why wouldn't it work now? This overconfidence, this haughtiness, would eventually come back to bite them. In the 1700s, the empire's central government began to weaken, which led to control of the provinces falling into the hands of local and regional leaders. Central government leadership struggled to regain power for a couple of reasons. Because at this point, the empire lacked the military might to suppress the power of these local leaders, and also because the locals supported the leaders in their regions over those of the empire and many of the other problems the Ottoman Empire faced, which I'll talk about in a second, are an outgrowth of the slipping power of the empire's government. Within the Ottoman Empire, there was no cohesive identity, which is not uncommon for an empire, 
a major challenge of having an empire is how are you going to join together these different countries and people groups you've conquered? Will you successfully be able to get them to identify with the empire? Because if you aren't able to get them to identify with the empire over time and over generations, they're going to want to leave. And there'll always be a threat to the unity of the empire. And you'll typically see this effort to foster identity with the empire attempted through cultural and religious assimilation. The unified Roman Empire and later the Western Roman Empire attempted to forge this unity among all their disparate territories, originally through Roman polytheism, and then in the later stages of the empire through Christianity. As these beliefs were spread across the empire, there was a great deal of syncretism among conquered groups of the empire, melding of native beliefs with the beliefs imposed by the empire. If you want to look at the United States as an empire, I would say it's a somewhat atypical empire since the U.S. has not always sought real estate, but empire through economic, militaristic, and diplomatic influence and domination. But it's an empire nonetheless. The U.S. has exerted a great deal of effort over its lifetime to promote a certain narrative of itself, a melding of capitalism and individual liberty, as well as a Christianity-influenced civil religion, as the ingredients that make it the best country in the world. A narrative effectively spread within its borders and beyond. Over time, this narrative encouraged many of the brightest and best, the most industrious, and the most motivated and driven across the globe to make their way to the United States for a better life for themselves, their families, and their descendants. Even many groups who have known all along that the narrative was a myth, people of color, LGBTQ plus people, people of minority religions, even groups such as Black Americans who came to the U.S. involuntarily, or Native Americans who had the U.S. imposed on them, have still believed in this narrative as aspirational. Think Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. Quote, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. End quote. Dr. King continues, quote, And this will be the day, this will be the day when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we'll be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. End quote. While Dr. King's overall message was much more complex and was a more direct assault to white supremacy than many Americans even today are comfortable with, it's hard to argue against King's dream because those lines in his 1963 speech appeal to America's narrative of itself. The Ottoman Empire, which conquered areas that were populated by people belonging to a number of religions, including Islam, 
Judaism, and Christianity was explicitly a Muslim empire for the vast majority of its existence. For some who have a passing understanding of the Ottoman Empire, it has the reputation of being fairly tolerant of non-Muslims. The reality, though, was a bit more complicated. The Ottoman Empire addressed religious diversity within its empire using a Dima system. The Dima system was a traditional Muslim form of relationship and coexistence with non-Muslims, or Dimi. Traditionally, the Dima system consisted of a tax, or jizya, assessed to Dimi in exchange for protection from Muslims and a degree of self-governance. And up until the Dima system and jizya tax were abolished in 1856, that is how the Ottoman Empire operated. The empire didn't systematically seek to convert non-Muslims to Islam across the board. And during much of its history, it allowed a degree of religious freedom for non-Muslim communities, which was fairly progressive for its time. It was also a place of refuge for Jews escaping pogroms in Christian European countries, which were unfortunately very common at that time. But non-Muslims were subject to a jizya that was not imposed on Muslims. There are also other guidelines, such as prohibition on proselytizing to Muslims, or in other words, trying to convert Muslims to Christianity, as well as laws barring non-Muslim men from marrying Muslim women, and there were restrictions on building new places of worship. Muslims had a favorite status in Ottoman society and were not subject to the jizya, and that led some non-Muslims especially some that were local leaders in the Balkans, to convert. But there were some cases of forced conversions. In part one, I very briefly mentioned Janissaries. As the empire was growing in the 1300s, there were conflicts developing among the empire's elites. To beef up its military might and to help the sultan, the leader of the empire, retain power, the empire began to engage in the practice of devshirmi, or child tax. Young boys from the ages of 8 to 20 were taken from Christian communities in southeastern Europe, in Christian communities in what are currently Greece, Albania, Bulgaria, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Serbia. There's some dispute as to if the parents allowed it or if the boys were forcibly taken without their consent, but these were Christian boys who were taken captive, separated from their native cultures, educated in the Muslim faith, and given training and apprenticeships in certain disciplines and trades according to their talents, and then put to work. This would typically be work in military, government service, or clergy. And Janissaries occupied a space in the empire that was sort of a mix of slave, public servant, and paid mercenary. And Janissaries converting to Islam as officially Muslim, were allowed more social mobility and political influence than they would have had as Dimi. But as a dominant empire, trying to bring your conquer groups together has its limits, especially the further away from home base you go. This was the case with the Roman Empire, as the further stretches of the empire began to break away first, and the empire lost pieces of itself until eventually falling in 476 AD. And this, in a sense, is also an issue in the United States, particularly without comparable diametrically opposed empire to go up against it in the Soviet Union. Ever since the Soviet Union dissolved in 1991, the United States has been in its own slow decline of empire, one that has been accelerated by Donald Trump laying bare to the world that the narrative the U.S. has of itself, that capitalism, individualism, Christianity-based civil religion, makes the United States the best country in the world, is a lie. The Ottoman Empire experienced these limits as well. Conversion to Islam in historically Christian areas of the Ottoman Empire varied wildly. On one hand, the presence of sizable Muslim populations in Bosnia-Herzegovina, Kosovo, and Albania, as well as in other parts of the Balkans to a lesser extent, is traceable to the legacy of the Ottoman Empire. But overall, conversion to Islam was not the norm. In the later years of the Ottoman Empire, 
religious identity started to become secondary to identity based on ethnicity and national origin, otherwise known as nationalism. During this period, nationalism became popular in Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Middle East due to social and political instability and unrest. There were nationalist movements among Arabs in the Middle East as well as among a number of the people groups in Eastern Europe. The furthest reaches of the Ottoman Empire began to break away and gain independence, in large part due to the rise in nationalism, with the help of major powers such as Russia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. During the 1800s, there are attempts made to modernize the Ottoman Empire, including a short-lived constitutional monarchy that ended with Sultan Abdul Hamid suspending the constitution and taking autocratic control of the empire in 1876. And due to the slowness of the empire to modernize, a succession of weak sultans and internal and external conflict, the Ottoman Empire found itself limping into the 20th century, dubbed the sick man of Europe. The Ottoman Empire continued to experience internal turmoil into the early 1900s. The Young Turk Revolution of 1908 led to efforts at modernist reform, including efforts at ending discrimination against non-Muslims, encouraging women's education and emancipation, and expanding the use of secular courts, while scaling back the use of Islamic courts. The Young Turks sought to essentially replace the empire's Muslim identity with a largely secular identity based on Turkish ethnicity. So, in other words, Turkish nationalism. Keep in mind that the Turks were the founding and dominant ethnicity of the Ottoman Empire. But the empire, even at this point, was heterogeneous, having incorporated a number of ethnic groups. This goal of Turkish nationalism, which was initially implicit, placed them in conflict with both Islamic religious leaders who saw the movement towards nationalist identity as heretical, and non-Muslim Ottoman leaders, who were wary of the turn toward Turkish nationalism. The Ottoman Empire had experienced their European possessions rebel due to their own nationalist movements and began to secede, including Bulgaria and other Eastern European nations that had been part of the empire. And these conditions meant that these groups that had coexisted during the majority of the empire's history were now clashing violently. Now, when I say the Young Turk Revolution was short-lived, I mean that. This lasted for only a few years. In 1913, the Committee of Union of Progress, or CUP, an outgrowth of the Young Turks, staged a coup and took over the government of the Ottoman Empire. The CUP government was an oligarchy consisting of a small group of officials with a central committee of three leaders known as the Three Pashas, or we can roughly translate it to the three generals. So the three pashas were Minister of War Enver Pasha, Minister of Internal Affairs Talat Pasha, and Minister of the Navy Jamal Pasha. The CUP was explicitly ultranationalist, and they sought to establish a Turkish ethnostate that included not only the existing Ottoman Empire, but the lands occupied by Turkish peoples in the Caucasus and Central Asia. If you recall in part one of this series, I mentioned that the Turks, who later came to inhabit the Anatolian Peninsula, originally came from the steppes of Central Asia. Well, there were still related groups in this area, as well as elsewhere in and around the Mediterranean, and Turkish nationalists wanted to essentially reunite their ethnic brethren. The problem was that some of these areas weren't controlled by the Ottoman Empire, and their original homeland, Central Asia, was within the borders of Russia. The Ottoman Empire, as the sick man of Europe, was in no position to take on Russia, but they would start working on their ethnostate from within. Beginning in the late 1800s and throughout the first quarter of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire began systematically going on campaigns of ethnic cleansing and genocide against non-Muslims and non-Turks. The most well-known and deadly of these genocides was against ethnic Armenians, which I'll get into a little later. 
But know that these genocidal campaigns were also perpetrated against a number of other social minorities in the Ottoman Empire in the name of Turkish nationalism. The empire was coming undone, and it was just in time for World War I. On Tuesday, September 22nd, Christian fiction author Allison K. Garcia is joining me here on Pastor Podcast. Allison's novels include Vivir el Dream and Finding a Moor. Her novels tend to focus on the lives of Latino immigrants in the United States. I truly enjoy Allison's writing, and she's great at bringing the characters alive and discussing difficult issues in a real and touching way. In this upcoming episode, we'll be chatting about issues related to immigration, particularly in light of the pandemic. And Allison will tell us more about her upcoming book, Finding Seguridad. Finding Seguridad is currently on pre-order at Amazon.com. I have my copy pre-ordered. Definitely looking forward to the release of this book, and it's set for release in about a month. I'll link to it in the show notes. Check out our conversation this Tuesday, September 22nd on Potstir Podcast. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. World War I, or what was then known as the Great War, would be the undoing of the Ottoman Empire, and as we're going to discuss, would lead to an agreement that would greatly affect the Middle East and relations between the region and the United States for a century and beyond. The First World War could be its own series, with a number of different side avenues that can be taken. It's often overshadowed by World War II in the history books, and while there are very good reasons for that, World War I also had a number of effects that went beyond it setting the stage for the eventual rise of the Nazi party in Germany in the lead-up to the Second World War. This summary won't do this period of history justice, but to very, very briefly summarize the First World War, World War I kicked off in Europe in 1914 due to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, along with his wife Sophie, by Serbian nationalist Gabrielo Princip. The heir's assassination triggered a number of strategic alliances, some of which were secret, and geared several countries up towards war initially in Europe as well as European holdings in Asia. But as the war raged on, it became a global war. The main players lined up on two sides. There were the Central Powers, which were headed up by the Austro-Hungarian Empire and also included Germany and Bulgaria. And there were the Allied Powers, supporting Serbia, which included the Triple Entente of Russia, Britain, and France as well as Italy. The United States would join on that side as well three years later. While the sides were ratcheting up towards war, the leadership of the Ottoman Empire was looking to figure out where they would stand on the war. Many members of the CUP wanted to remain neutral. The empire did not have strong alliances with countries on either side of the conflict. And outside Russia's interest in Istanbul, In the straits between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, the European powers involved didn't have interests in the Ottoman Empire either. But Minister of War Enver Pasha wanted the empire to join the war. So in November of 1914, the Ottoman Empire signed a secret defensive treaty with Germany, one of the central powers. And the reason why Enver wanted to join the central powers in the war was because their rather large rival, Russia, who shared a border with them, was on the Allied, or Triple Entente, side. And in the war, he saw an opportunity to unite ethnic Turks in Russian Central Asia with the Ottoman Empire. Unfortunately for the future of the empire, they chose the wrong side. Now, at first, this wasn't so clear. While the Ottomans initially lost a battle in 1914 at Sarikamis in eastern Anatolia, a battle that saw them lose most of their third army, they saw some brief progress on their front of the war as the Triple Entente withdrew from the Dardanelles, a strait in the northwest Anatolian peninsula. 
between 1915 and 1916, and the Russians ended up bowing out of the Great War early due to the Russian Revolution in 1917. But some of the subjects within the empire had a sense that the war wouldn't end well for their overlords, which we'll get into in a moment. The Ottoman Empire, while fighting a world war, was also fighting an internal war against their own people. In particular, populations considered outsiders. And even though the empire was now pretty much secular, and the Muslim populations of Turkey consisted of ethnic Turks and non-Turks, generally speaking, the non-Muslim population was ethnically non-Turkish. So in a lot of cases, religion was seen as a proxy for non-Turkish identity. Between 1894 and 1924, the percentage of Christians in Asia Minor plummeted from 20% to just under 2% due to a combination of expulsion and mass murder. And while this statistic covers a 30-year period, this campaign stemming from Turkish nationalism in the Ottoman Empire was at its height during the First World War. The most egregious campaign of terror and genocide was enacted against Armenian Christians in eastern Anatolia and Cilicia. Between 1915 and 1916, the Ottoman Empire went on a campaign to purge their Armenian population from the region. The government started out with deporting Armenian elites in April 1915, and a month later issued an order to expel the entire Armenian population. This expulsion order involved forcing the Armenians out on what were essentially death marches into the desert and elsewhere outside of Anatolia, where they were tortured, massacred by bands of Turkish nationalists, and died from starvation and disease. As many as one and a half million Armenians died in what is referred to by most historians, genocide scholars, as well as the Armenians today, as the Armenian Genocide. To this day, Turkey, the successor country to the Ottoman Empire, considers that 1.5 million death toll an exaggeration and refuses to accept responsibility for this horrific chapter in world history. While the Armenian Genocide was the worst example of how the Ottoman Empire fought against their subjects during the First World War, there are a number of other instances where Turkish nationalism led to the deaths of the empire's minority populations. Lebanon, which had been a semi-autonomous zone within the Ottoman Empire since 1860, run by Lebanese and Syrian Christians and Druze, lost their status during the war and was taken over by Turkish nationalists. Due to effects of the war and possibly the government's mismanagement of Lebanon, that part is somewhat debated, the region endured a famine from 1915 through 1918 that led to mass starvation and the deaths of around 200,000 people, amounting to half the region's population. If you recall when I discussed Syrian and Lebanese immigration to the United States in the early 1900s, Back in part two of this podcast series, this is what they were escaping. According to political scientist R.J. Rummel, from 1900 to 1923, the Ottoman Empire and later the Republic of Turkey killed between 3.5 million and 4.3 million of their Christian minorities, including Armenians, Greeks, Nestorians, and a number of others. To this day, Turkey claims that these purges were necessary to protect the empire from disloyal groups. But most groups targeted for mass executions, including the Armenians, were found to be largely loyal to the empire, and the fear stoked by Turkish nationalists that these minorities were disloyal were largely unfounded. Nationalism is a hell of a drug. But while many of the Ottoman Empire's genocidal actions were focused on religious minorities, they were not necessarily friends with their Muslim populations either, particularly Muslims who were not ethnically Turkish. Hundreds of thousands of Arabs and Kurds were also massacred during this period. There was a great deal of bad blood between the Ottoman Empire and the Arab population in the Middle East, to say the least. Arab leaders in the Middle East had become increasingly suspicious of Istanbul for quite some time. During the war, 
Arab nationalists attempted to rise up against the Ottoman Empire. The greatest of these revolts was the Great Arab Revolt of 1916. The uprisings led to the execution of groups of Arab nationalists, but conflict between Turkish nationalists and Arab groups in the Middle East would be the genesis of the treaty that would change the trajectory of the Middle East for decades to come. While the CUP went all in with the central powers, Arab leaders could see the tea leaves and bet that the war would not turn out well for the empire. Because of that, Arab nationalist leaders in greater Syria, which roughly covers present-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine, made a deal with France exchanging a pledge to revolt against the Ottoman Empire for weaponry, support, and sovereignty granted by the French for greater Syria should the Triple Entente win the war. Around the same time, the Sharif of Mecca, Hussein bin Ali, engaged in a letter exchange with the British, specifically Lieutenant Colonel Sir Henry McMahon, who was the British High Commissioner to Egypt. Hussein was an Arab Muslim from the Hashemite family, and a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. The Hashemites rule the country of Jordan today. As Sharif of Mecca, Hussein was the steward of Mecca, the holiest of cities in Islam, as well as Medina, another holy Islamic city. At the time, he and his family were in a power struggle for the Arabian Peninsula in the hearts and minds of Muslims around the world with another Arab Muslim family, the House of Saud, who were powerful in Central Arabia. Both were powerful Arab Sunni Muslim families, but the House of Saud, who are the ruling family in what is now Saudi Arabia, promoted a splinter movement of Sunni Islam called Wahhabism. When you hear about Islamic fundamentalism or Islamic extremism, what is typically being discussed is Wahhabism. Started by Islamic activist and theologian Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab In the 1700s, Wahhabism sought to eradicate practices within the faith it considered idolatrous deviations from true Islam and a return to a very conservative version of the faith. But due to a very early alliance the founder made with the House of Saud that endures to the present day, Wahhabism has been infused with politics for much of its existence. Due to the power struggle with the House of Saud, as well as conflict with the Ottoman Empire, Hussein bin Ali looked to use the Great War to secure freedom for Arab Muslims and an advantage for the Hashemite family when it came to who would rule the Arabian Peninsula. So Hussein began his letter-writing exchange with the British representative McMahon in what would become known as the Hussein-McMahon Correspondence. Through a deal made in this correspondence, the Hashemites would align with Britain on this Triple Entente side. In the correspondence, the deal was for the Hashemites to revolt against the Ottoman Empire and give the British favorable treatment and trade. In exchange, Britain agreed to provide food, gold, weapons, and ammunition in support of the revolt and would recognize the independence of Arab lands in the Arabian Peninsula with Hussein bin Ali as leader. So the Arab Revolt was on. From mid-1916 through the end of World War I, the Arab nationalists of Greater Syria and the Hashemites of the Arabian Peninsula would rise up against the Ottoman Empire with the help of Britain and France. But if these Arab leaders thought that their European allies would hold up their end of the bargain, they would be sadly mistaken. See... While these deals were being made with Arab leaders during the war, Britain and France had other ideas for the Middle East, having already agreed to a deal with each other. In early 1916, after a couple of months of negotiation, Britain and France agreed to a partitioning of the Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire into spheres of influence these two countries would control should the Triple Entente win the war and the Ottoman Empire is defeated. According to their agreement, the Syrian coast and much of modern-day Lebanon would go to France. Britain would control central and southern Mesopotamia, around the Baghdad and Basra provinces in modern-day Iraq. 
Palestine would be administered by a conglomerate of powers due to Russian interest in the region. The rest of the land, a swath of territory including modern-day Syria, Mosul in northern Iraq, and Jordan, would be run by local Arab chiefs. In the north, they would answer to France, and in the south, they would answer to Britain. And Britain and France would be able to freely travel and trade in the other zone of influence. Russia and Italy would also be parties to the agreement originally, but Russia's early exit from the war and Turkish nationalist victories in Anatolia led to Russia and Italy dropping out of their portion of the agreement. Named after British diplomat Mark Sykes and French diplomat Francois Georges Picot, the authors of the agreement, the Sykes-Picot Agreement was kept secret. The Arab leaders these countries made deals with were not told of this existing agreement and that per Sykes-Picot, they would not receive the independence they were promised. The Sykes-Picot Agreement wouldn't be exposed until the Russian Revolution when the Bolsheviks revealed the agreement publicly in late 1917. Despite the revelation of Sykes-Picot, Britain still claimed to support Arab independence, but this was not to be in the end. The Triple Entente won the war in 1918. The Ottoman Empire was devastated by the war and would be partitioned at the Conference of San Remo in 1920. At the conference, the Treaty of Severus abolished the Ottoman Empire, and what was now Turkey was required to renounce all rights to Arab Asia and North Africa, and it made other provisions that were later rejected by Turkey, particularly in independent Armenia and Kurdish autonomy. The Middle East, which the empire lost, would be partitioned by the French and the British into Class A mandates that were different from the original Sykes-Picot Agreement, but drafted in much the same spirit. The northern half of the former Ottoman province of Syria, which are modern-day Syria and Lebanon, was mandated to France. The southern half, Palestine, as well as the province of Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq, was mandated to Britain. What this meant was that borders would be drawn based on the interests of the countries in charge of the mandates. On paper, the Middle Eastern countries would be considered independent, but would be essentially ruled by the mandate holders until they determined that these countries had reached political maturity. The Sykes-Picot Agreement and the partition that eventually resulted after the war were extremely problematic for the region and for international relations for a number of reasons. Here are three key ones. Number one, the agreement irreparably harmed relations between the Middle East and the West. Britain and France made deals with Arab leaders in the name of political expediency during wartime, knowing on some level that they weren't going to hold up their end of the bargain. They weren't going to give Arabs or any of the groups in the Middle East the independence and self-determination they were seeking, with the notable exception of the House of Saud. Kind of. The House of Saud initially stayed loyal to the Ottoman Empire earlier in the war, but later switched sides and joined the British. Post-World War I, the Hashemites under Hussein bin Ali and later his eldest son, Emir Ali, would engage in skirmishes with the House of Saud under Abdul Aziz al-Saud, until the British took the side of the House of Saud and they conquered the Hashemites in 1925. What would become Saudi Arabia was a protectorate of Great Britain until 1927 and on full independence would continue to be run by the House of Saud with their borders largely intact. The country officially became the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in 1932. But in general, when everything was said and done, Britain and France were essentially given the Middle East with the consent of the other allied powers and without the say of the people who actually lived there and fought on their behalf. The optics here are pretty terrible. Number two, other, other than the exception I mentioned, Saudi Arabia, there would not be independence for Middle Eastern countries. So Arab leaders, especially Hussein bin Ali, who stuck their necks out to fight against the Ottoman Empire in the Arab Revolt, weren't getting what they had been seeking, the main endgame, and were essentially exchanging one occupier for another. And not only that, 
These new occupiers were largely ignorant of the history and customs of the lands they were administering. Independence wouldn't be granted to most Middle Eastern countries created by partition for decades. Syria and Lebanon gained independence from France in 1943 during the Second World War. The mandate ended in Palestine in 1948, and hours after that was the establishment of what would become the modern state of Israel. Egypt was overthrown in 1952, and the same happened to Iraq in 1958. Britain and France would later withdraw from the region over the course of the 1960s and 1970s, leading to independence for other countries on the Arabian Peninsula. Number three, the partitioning, both the proposed partitions in Sykes-Picot and the actual partition of the Conference of San Remo, did not take into account where the various groups within the Middle East actually lived. Borders were made arbitrarily by ruler and pencil. This meant ethnic groups such as the Kurds and the Druze had no country of their own and were split among a number of other countries as small disjointed minorities. It also meant that groups with a history of conflict with each other would be stuck living together in the same country. One of the most notable examples of border issues is Iraq. Iraq's artificial borders have meant that large groups of Shia and Sunni Muslims, which I've discussed previously have fundamental religious disagreements, are forced to live together. The population is mostly Shia, but has been run by Sunnis for decades. This is an issue because Iran, which is a Shia-run country, shares a border with Iraq, which has led to some conflict. Also within Iraq is a small Kurdish community who have been vulnerable to violent reprisals by the Iraqi government. These long-lasting border issues have meant that it is extremely difficult for many Middle Eastern countries to develop healthy governments and unified civil societies. And due to that, lend themselves to authoritarian strongman regimes, puppet leadership, extremist politics, and are vulnerable to failure. This particular effect of partition cannot be overstated. While the current borders in the Middle East are due more to the conference of San Remo than Sykes-Picot, Sykes-Picot is used as shorthand for the imposition of borders on the region by the West, and more generally, the symbol of Western interference and meddling in this part of the world. Some of the most powerful political movements in the Middle East during the 20th and 21st centuries, including Baathism in Iraq and Syria, Nasserism in Egypt, and even when we look at terror groups such as ISIS, these groups have seized on Sykes-Picot, or at least the imagery of it, and have sought to alter or eliminate the imposed borders as part of their movements. This chapter in world history isn't directly related to the United States, but there are a couple of important takeaways. It should be noted that U.S. foreign policy in the region abides by the borders imposed by the partition. But besides that, Sykes-Picot sets the stage for much of what would come later that did directly involve the United States. This includes proxy wars that occurred in the Middle East and surrounding regions due to the Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union between 1947, which was two years after the end of World War II, and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. This also includes U.S. foreign policy decisions that have been at the heart of conflict involving the U.S. and both state and non-state actors in the Middle East. Oftentimes, our present is the consequence of decisions made long ago before many of us were even born, but have long-lasting, far-reaching results. The other takeaway is this. There are parts of the world today, including the United States, that are experiencing nationalist movements. Donald Trump has said that he is a nationalist. When we look at political history, nationalism, especially when embraced by dominant groups within declining countries, is often a dangerous development. The state encouraged violence within the United States, particularly calls from Trump and others within his regime for his base to rise up in a violent manner, is quite concerning. For many people, the go to comparison tends to be Nazi Germany. But while it's an apt comparison, 
it's not the only historical comparison we can draw from. There are many other historical examples where nationalism leads to the oppression and mass murder of political minorities. And the decline of the Ottoman Empire is one of them. Those who do not learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. On Tuesday, September 22nd, I will be releasing the most recent conversation I had with author Allison K. Garcia, so definitely stay tuned for that. I'll be resuming the U.S. Middle East Relations series after the election. I really want to discuss the Cold War, particularly proxy wars involving the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and more in relation to the subject, so I'm really excited for that. Until then, episodes that will be released prior to the U.S. general election on November 3rd will be focused on the election. That includes an episode I'm going to release next month about political polling. And there may be something cool coming around the time of the election. I'll say more as time gets closer and I can finalize some things. In the meantime, if you're eligible to vote, make sure you register as soon as possible. Take advantage of early voting if it's available in your state. Whatever you do, make sure you vote. As always, thank you so much for listening to Potstirer Podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, yes, Potstirer Podcast is now on Amazon Music, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Go to potstirerpodcast.com slash download, and the links are listed right there. If you subscribe, you'll get new episodes once they come out. No waiting. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give it five stars and leave a review on your choice app. And I'm always tweeting. So follow me on Twitter at PotStirrerCast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.